As much as I thought it best to delete the material that we were going to discuss about inspiration, about the inspiration of Scripture, because we just simply would do it injustice to really begin. Consequently, I think that we will will deal with the canon of Scripture in detail, more detail than we had planned on, so that what we say here about the canon will also uh, come under or our the tapes and things that we give here for the canon of Scripture will also come under theology in the, in the uh, future. Whenever we get to theology, we're not going to duplicate this again. So whenever we get there, as a matter of fact, in most most uh, your theology books, they don't even deal with the subject of canonicity. Of course, all of them deal with inspiration, but not very many of them deal with canonicity at all. As a matter of fact, some of them have maybe one or two pages. I think Hodge has one page, and he's got maybe 15 hundred pages of theology and I think he might have one or two dealing with the subject of the canon and most of them aren't any better than that <laughs> most of them have maybe five or six or seven if they even deal with it at all because I looked up to see to what see what some of their positions were some of them deal with it in detail like Shedd does in his theology but Shedd is wrong in his uh, views of the canon and what canonicity is and what determines canonicity and what are the rules for entrance into the canon. And it's just, uh, it's a neglected subject, in other words. Inspiration, everyone knows something about inspiration, or at least they think they know something about it. Mm -hmm. And all of your writers will deal with that because that is a major and a crucial doctrine concerning uh, bibliology and the study of the Bible. But equally important is the subject of the canon of Scripture because we have to find out, are these really the books that are supposed to be in here? Uh, inspiration is, is an important subject and needs to be studied, and we will study it in the future. But we want to look, first of all, at, at canonicity here and therefore deal with it in detail. I don't really know how long it'll take us to cover it. We've got some academic things to look at here tonight. Uh, but however long we'll stay on it, and then when we come to theology, then these tapes will simply be placed under that series as well as under this series. It'll be the same messages under both things. What we want to look at tonight is the need for a canon. Now, we're looking at the historical formation of the canons. We'll be looking at the historical formation of the Old Testament canon, first of all, followed by a study of the historical formation of the New Testament canon to find out just how the Jews and how the early Christians went about understanding canonicity. Did they even, did they understand canonicity? And, excuse me, if they did, how they went about gathering these books together, what was the criteria for putting them in their quote-unquote canon of Scripture? You see, so many people, and you ask them this, and they might not tell you this, but it's the misconception they've got in their mind, nonetheless, that King David had an Old Testament with him out there when he was guarding the flock. <laughs> and that the Apostle John, while he was on the island of Patmos, had a little pocket New Testament in his back pocket that he was reading out there on the island. <laughs> that is the average Christian's conception. Um, it's shown, it's become a joke now, but I mean, people have actually said this and believed it, referring to the these and the vows in the Bible. If they were good enough for Paul, then they're good enough for us today. And they say that not even realizing what they're saying, that they're making the most fallacious <laughs> statements that could be made. You never heard that before? I had one fellow say it to me. He said, well, he said, if the these and vows were good enough for Paul, they're good enough for me doesn't realize they came 1,600 years after Paul. <laughs> it's when the these and the vows came along. So he only uh, elucidated his ignorance on the subject that he really didn't know anything about the Bible. The same thing is true with people having the misconception that the early Christians carried around an Old Testament with them. I mean, that's not quite as bad as carrying around a new since they were living in the period of the new, but it's equally bad to think that everyone had a pocket Old Testament that you had in your pocket and you carried around with you in rent. But I want to tell you something. If you look over in Luke chapter 4, the Christians, those Christians of the first century who didn't have Bibles knew their Bible better than we do today. Right. Right. I want to give you an example. 
Well, I'll give you a demonstration first, and then I'll give you an example. To show you what <coughs> the attitude was concerning the, the memorization of Scripture and acquainting oneself with what the Word of God said. They didn't have a pocket old or a pocket new. They didn't even have some of these some of these Bibles today that some of you carry around weigh five or ten pounds. I don't see why you carry around a Bible that's that big. <laughs> just say, well, I guess you could do that, but it's just not handy. But anyway, they're big Bibles, five pound Bibles. Some people carry around today. I won't look to see who's got the biggest one out there. <laughs> uh, I keep mine small. It's in a cover here, but you see, that's my Bible's a good inch or two smaller on all sides than what my cover is here. It's handy. But they didn't have it big or small. They didn't have Bibles to carry around with them. But they knew what the Old Testament said. Chapter 4 of Luke, verse 16. Now bear in mind what we have said thus far in this series of teachings that the writings, the Old Testament writings, were not in a book folio form. That wasn't invented until centuries later. They were on the long, cumbersome, expensive, difficult-to-use scrolls or rolls of the Old Testament scribes. So, verse 16, this sheds a lot of light on the subject here. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the scroll. Shouldn't be book because, uh, as you'll see, that makes it too easy. There was delivered unto him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the scroll, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Isaiah 61 and verse 1 and so forth. Now, he has a scroll who, who, which has no chapter division, no verse division, doesn't even have any pages in it. You can memorize, well, turn 15 pages to the right and you'll get to it. <laughs> Nothing but a scroll. You just unroll and unroll and unroll. And notice what it says in verse 17. And when he had opened the scroll, then he found. And we're not to assume that they sat around all day for him looking for it, trying to find it. When he opened it, then he found the place where it was written. Now, you see what that shows you? You've got to know your Old Testament, your Bible of that day, extremely well. Now, what he is quoting is Isaiah chapter 61, beginning with verse 1. Now, we're going to give you a little illustration of what that would be like. You couldn't do it with the Bible you have. It's too easy to find. But here's how you'd have to find your passage. You'd have to open up just to somewhere. They handed him a scroll that had Isaiah. Now, he'd know his passage if he knew his Bible well, and we know that he did. It was somewhere towards the end. But how far towards the end, there's no way of knowing. So you'd have to turn so far and read a text, and then you'd have to know, am I too far or not far enough? Mm -hmm. No verses, no chapters. Let's see if you can do it. Tell me whether I'm supposed to go forward or backward. You're looking in your scroll. You're trying to find Isaiah 61. And here's all you find. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and fought against them. Now, do you go backwards or forward? <laughs> backwards. <laughs> See, they'd still be sitting there in the synagogue for you, brother. <laughs> well, let's try again. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. It doesn't matter how far I read, you're going to miss it anyway. <laughs> and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all their raiment. Now, have we gone too far or not far enough? Backwards or forward? Forward. Backward. Backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go again. Thou art wearied in the greatness of thy way, yet saidest thou not there is no hope. See, I haven't given you any verses you've got memorized. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too smart for that. <laughs> thou hast found the life of thine hand, therefore thou wast not grieved. Backwards or forwards? Well, you see, it'd be just be a yes to you. Yeah. Why you don't know Isaiah well enough. Amen. Now, how do you like that? That's how they had to know <laughs> their scrolls back then. 
Now, obviously, if he didn't know that verse, he can read on to the next one, but you can only sit there so long before they say, well, fella, if you don't know enough to find the passage, we're certainly not going to let you read in our synagogue. Mm -hmm. uh, You've got to be able to find where that is. Mm -hmm. But why is it today we say turn to Obadiah, and you hear the pages <laughs> turning back and forth. <laughs> And you've got a table of contents in the beginning of the Bible. I'm saying you generically speaking. Because where, there have been other places where you just have to wait. And what was going to be an hour's message really is a two hours message. Because that much time is wasted in people trying to find Obadiah. They, they can't find it. And there's an old joke, and this is true. If you tell some people to find Hezekiah in the Bible, they'll take off looking for Hezekiah. <laughs> Pretty soon they'll get frustrated, and they'll go to the front of their Bible, and it won't be there. <laughs> I've never pulled that on anyone, but uh, it has worked. I've heard that it's worked for people in the past. Just tell them to turn to Hezekiah, and you can go take a lunch break while most of the church is looking for Hezekiah. <laughs> when you come back, they will have gotten smart on you and found out there's no such thing as Hezekiah. Uh, but this is how well they had to know what was written in the Word of God. You see, some of you would have missed it on all three times. You'd still be there looking for Isaiah 61. And pretty soon, well, I can't find that. I'll just substitute some other passage that I can't find there. He's looking for a particular... <laughs> well, you can see. I mean, you can see some people. You can see them in your mind just like a fan turning through the Bible pages looking for that passage. When they've got a table of contents, they've got book divisions, they've got pages, they've got chapter divisions. The pages, even if you didn't have anything else, the pages make it easy. Right. Because if you're wanting to go back there to Isaiah, just do that. That's how quick. Well, I went past time to Jeremiah. But a scroll, you're going to be unrolling it. You've got to unroll one side, and when you unroll it, you've got to roll the other side up. And as you're unrolling, you're, you're rolling, and you're trying to read and trying to think now, am I going too far or not far enough? Look over in Acts chapter 13 to give you an example here of Paul's knowledge of his Old Testament, which was true with all of the early believers. Now, this isn't another illustration. We could just do that all night long here. We could go back to a book you know yeah. and give you some passages and tell you have we gone too far, not far enough, and you wouldn't know. Why? Because you don't know the book well enough. You don't know the verses well enough to know where they are in the book. But here in chapter 13 of Acts, you need to realize that Paul, in his sermons here, does not have a Bible like I have to look down at and read something from. He is quoting what he's quoting from memory from the Old Testament. Verse 29. Which, by the way, is at least part of an answer concerning why the, the references in the New Testament to Old Testament passages are not given in a verbal quotation. It's because they don't have them memorized in a verbal quotation, but they know what the passage says. And they give it in essence, just like you would give a passage in essence, and that would be the essence of what the passage says. As a matter of fact, even when, you see, Paul is just standing here preaching in chapter 13 of Acts. Even when Paul is sitting down and writing sometimes, he doesn't always have a lot of scrolls with him to look up a certain passage even though he's sitting there writing something, let's say, like Colossians while he's in prison. He may have a few Old Testament scrolls with him, but he's not going to have all 39 books of the Old Testament with him to look up a passage. If he wants to say something about a passage, he has to be able to pull that out of his memory. No, if you're asking the question, doesn't the Holy Spirit just tell him? No. There's no shortcut for knowing the Word of God, and that would be a shortcut. Well, I'll just pray and the Holy Spirit will tell me everything. No. Try it. It didn't work for you here on Isaiah. <laughs> it won't work. He expects you to know where these things are. Verse 29, When they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher, but God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them, which, come up, which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you the glad tidings, the gospel, the good news, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now he wasn't starting his 
sermon, well, he starts, of course, way back in verse 15, when he also is asked to stand up in the synagogue. And they say, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation, then stay on. And so Paul starts staying on. And he doesn't have it planned out ahead of time. Now, I'm only going to give a sermon where I'm going to come across a passage that I'm sure that I already know. He just starts preaching what he's preaching. So he has to know passages that are going to meet the need when he needs a text. When he gets down to verse 33, he's been building his whole thing around this. He's got the text. He said it was written in the second psalm. Obviously, they were divided because they're written by different people. Thou art my son this day. Have I begotten thee? And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, here he goes quoting again, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, here he goes again, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And besides just the quotes that he's giving, if you look back earlier in verses 15 through 25, he's having to know his history of the Old Testament. In giving his period of the judges, back in verse 7, how many nations were destroyed in Canaan? How many years elapsed? Verse, well, really the end of verse 19. The authorized has it in verse 20. Let's see, verse 21. We're never told in the Old Testament how long Saul was a king. But look at here. Afterward they desired a king. God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. Paul must have done some study in chronology because that's never given to us anywhere in the Old Testament. It's given of David that he reigned in Hebron seven and a half years and in Jerusalem 33. And you told it up and David had a reign of 40 years. But uh, we're not ever told how long King Saul reigned. Paul had to have studied something concerning dates and figures and statistics in the Old Testament to come up with this figure here of 40 years. Well, let's go on and look at some things here. We see on several occasions that people are putting things into writing long ago in the Old Testament. Let me give you some examples. We see Moses beginning to put things into writing. Numbers chapter 5 and verse uh, 23. Deuteronomy chapter 31. Verses 24 to 27. Joshua 1 8. We see Joshua is writing things. Joshua 24 26. Samuel is writing. 1 Samuel 10 25. Jeremiah is writing on some scrolls. Chapter 25 and verse 13. Daniel wrote something, Daniel 12, 4. Nahum wrote something, Nahum chapter 1 and verse 1. So we see from these passages and a multiplicity of other ones that God is giving revelation concerning the kingdom of God, and that's really what the whole Bible concerns is the kingdom of God and its final establishment and prevailing over all the forces of darkness and the forces of Satan. God's giving revelation concerning the kingdom of God and its establishment, and he is commanding that men write down and make recorded tradition of what he is giving them. Now, as this goes along, of course, you've got many, many things. The thing I mentioned there in Numbers 5 and verse 23 is the book that the priest had to write some of the curses in in the trial of jealousy. And if the woman was proven to be innocent, then these were to be blotted out. So there are just many, many different types of writings and different types of books that are being written during that time. Which brings us to the question, why was there a need for a canon in the first place? Now, we have reference here to a general question which covers both Old and New Testament. Now, we're going to give you several answers, beginning with one of these this evening. Why was there a need for a canon? And then when we get to the actual study of the historical formation of the old and the new canons, then we'll give you some more specific reasons that would fall under that. But this is a general question with some general answers. Why was there a need for a canon? You think about the question, why would there be a need for 
a cannon? Well, first of all, because there were many other books floating around, both in the Old and the New Testament days. Some of these claimed to be canonical. Some of them didn't. Some of them did. Even the ones that didn't sometimes were quite inspiring for the individual to read. So with the, with the addition of many books floating around in both the Old Testament era and the New Testament era, there soon became a need for a final, a final summation of a canon for the Old Testament and of a canon for the New. When we talk about the, the final collection of the books, and we mean just that. We don't mean that there hasn't been some form of canon prior to that, because as we'll see in the historical study of the subject, from the day the first book was written, there's always been a canon of Scripture. But it's different when you talk about the final summation of the canon of Scripture, because then you're talking about no more after this. This is the end of books. For whatever purpose, this is the end right here. And that's an interesting thing to, sketch, to oh, discuss. Yeah. Why reach a certain time and say, no more? Why do we get to Malachi, no more, after Malachi the prophet, the last of the prophets in the Old Testament? No more after that. Why after John, no more after the book of Revelation? Because right after that, Clement wrote his epistle to the Corinthians. And it's scriptural because he's quoting Paul's letter to the Corinthians. But no more after John. Okay, under this, we're going to look at two different things. These, these variety, this variety of books that we have floating around. First of all, we have what are known as our lost books. Now, there, a book came out many years ago called The Lost Books of the Bible. And... The books that are contained in that book, I've got that book. It was called to stir among Christians. The name of the book is The Lost Books of the Bible. A sequel was published called The Forgotten Books of Eden. And now they're together, I believe, in one book called The Lost Books of the Bible and The Forgotten Books of Eden. Now, the books here, uh, the whole thrust of the publication of the material seem to be, anyway, in the direction that perhaps these were, it was at least raising the question, these books were written in biblical antiquity, Old and New Testament antiquity, why weren't they included? Now, we're not raising that question at all right now, why weren't they included, and we're not even discussing many of the books that they call lost books of the Bible, because as a matter of fact, the very books that are contained, this is a large book with a lot of books in it, the very books that are contained in this book, called the Lost Books of the Bible, are not lost. We still have copies of those. One of the books here is Clement's Letter. We still got copies of Clement's Letter and a lot of other things. So it's a misnomer to call the book the Lost Books of the Bible when it doesn't contain lost books. Well, some of them are, but many of the books contained in this particular collection uh, simply have been found. They're extant with us today. The books that we are discussing under this subject, the lost books of the Bible, are books that are mentioned in Scripture, but that we don't have with us today. Now, you'll be surprised. We're going to find about 20 of them in the Bible, 20 other books in the Bible that are non-canonical books, but that we find here. Now, most of them fall under one category, and that is the category of source material for the canonical writers, the vast majority of them. <clears throat> fall under the category of source material. There are a couple uh, that would fall under the category of simply being providentially misplaced and therefore left out of the canon. For our first one, we turn back to numbers. This is the earliest one that we have. Well, let me say something before we turn there. Turn back to Genesis 5. Genesis 5 and verse 1. We're not going to count this as the lost book of the Bible because, if anything, it was simply a genealogical list. 
This is the book of the generations of Adam. So if anything, it was nothing more than a genealogical list, and we're not even certain that something like that actually exi existed. I've made reference to it in times past, but we're not certain that something like this actually existed. But you get over to the book of Numbers, chapter 21, and we have a mention of one of these lost books of the Bible. We're going to just take our time to find the passages that refer to each one of these and see what we can learn from them. So this is what we mean by lost books of the Bible, those books which are not included in Scripture but are mentioned as source material for the canonical writers or those which have been providentially misplaced. And by that we mean God didn't intend for the book to end up in the canon, although it wasn't used for source material, it was still inspirational, it was still instructive to the original recipients, but it was not intended to be uh, included within the final canon of the Bible. Numbers 21, <coughs> verses 14 and 15. Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord. You see, many people have asked, well, what was the book of the wars of the Lord? What he did in the Red Sea and in the brooks of Arnon and at the stream of the brooks that goeth down to the dwelling of Ar and lieth upon the border of Moab. Now, there has been debate on where do we end. You see, the writer here, uh, Moses the writer, is getting a quotation from this book. He said, Wherefore, it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, and here he goes, he's taking a quotation from this book called the book of the wars of the Lord. But where does he end his quote? Some people think that he goes all the way down to verse 20 because we have this song that Israel sang, beginning with verse 17. And because the places mentioned in verses 18 and 19 of the Israelites' itinerary are not found anywhere else in the Pentateuch as being stopping places for the Israelites. So some people have suggested since these are isolated references here and not found anywhere else, probably the reason was that Moses took all of this material out of the book of the wars of the Lord. <coughs> Our contention is most likely he stops with verse 15 for his quotation. The second half of verse 14 and verse 15 constitutes a quotation from the book of the wars of the Lord. Now the very first sentence here is a very poor translation, what he did in the Red Sea and should not be there. What it says is, Wahib in the storm, W-A-T-B in the storm that's what you should have instead of what he did in the red sea why because what he's talking about in the account you see the wherefore connects verse 14 with verses 12 and 13 <coughs> and what he's talking about is the victories that they have won over the ammonites and the red sea doesn't have anything to do with the ammonites so it is totally out of place chronologically to be fit in here when it says what he did in the Red Sea. What it should say is Wahib or Wahib in the storm. Now I have to explain what that means. After Wahib or Wahib, you could put in parentheses, this has to be understood because you don't have a subject for the sentence in the Hebrew just like that. He took. So you've got Wahib he took in the storm. Now, this word Wahib doesn't appear anywhere else. It appears to be the name of an Ammonite stronghold or fortress. And this is a particular fortress that Israel was able to take with God uh, as their chief, as their commander-in-chief. In the storm, the Hebrew has the word Sufa there, which simply means storm, you don't need to have Sufa because Wahib is enough to contend with. It simply is, again, this is a poetical book and so this is a poetic quotation here that he took them in his fury. So it's representing God as the commander in chief of the Israelites taking this particular stronghold in his fury. What is this book? It appears to be a collection of odes or points describing the victories that Israel won 
with God as their commander in chief. Now the title shows that the conception of God as far as the Israelites were concerned at this time was indeed that he himself was their commander in chief because the name of the book is the book of the wars of the Lord. God didn't fight any battles. Israel was the one fighting the battles. So it shows that they understood at this time, it's an early understanding for them to have, but they did understand at this time that God was in total control and that he was their commander in chief and that all the battles they were fighting were really not their battles. They were the battles that God was fighting through them on their behalf, which is the material we get just from the name of the book, the book of the wars of the Lord. So I said it appears to be a book of a collection of odes and points discussing these victories. Very similar, if you don't understand that, very similar to uh, Exodus chapter 15 and the song or the ode that Moses and Miriam sang after God's victory over the Egyptians in the Red Sea. In other words, uh, this would be a very uh, a similar account. What he's quoting from, the book of the wars of the Lord would just be full of all types of testimonies but that don't or that didn't make it into the Bible as canonical, except this quotation here uh, that he takes. But if you look back in Exodus 15, you see that most of them sang uh, a very similar ode here that God had won victories for them. So this was simply, in other words, national literature of the Hebrews, what, it, what all the critics say that the Bible is. You see, the, the Hebrews did have their national literature, as you'll see as we discuss more of it. But the Bible's not part of it. The Bible's the Word of God. The book of the wars of the Lord's not the Word of God. The book of the wars of the Lord is the national literature, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Gettysburg Address, uh, my dream, Martin Luther's dream, you know, the folklore. Not that it was lore in the sense that it didn't take place, uh, but the events that they had happened in their national history. So sure, they had their national literature. Some of it was true. Some of it probably wasn't true. Why? It wasn't written by inspired writers. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Verse 3, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. And his chosen captains also were drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. And thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. In other words, Exodus 15 could itself have possibly that song made it into the book of the wars of the Lord. But it doesn't mean that all that are in the book of the wars of the Lord is going to make it into the Bible. Just this one quote that we have back here in Numbers. Okay, that's book number one. We've got a second book. It's called, in the King James, the book of Jasher. It's seen in two places. So this is very interesting that we're going to have two quotations from this book. Joshua 10, verses 12 to 13. 2 Samuel 1, verses 17 through 27. Now, Jasher is not a proper name. It's a Hebrew word which means the righteous one. So this, it looks like it's a proper name in your Bible, but it shouldn't be. This is the book of the righteous one, and it's called the book of Jasher. All right, Joshua chapter 10. Over the centuries, there have been many books purporting to be the long-lost book of Jasher. The Israelites have one to this day, but it's simply not. It is indeed long-lost. We've only got two fragments. Both of these fragments are commemorating heroic deeds done by important men in Israel. Therefore, that is the way we would describe the whole book, because we only have two examples here to base our description on. So the book of the righteous one or the book of Jasher would be the book which records the heroic deeds that mighty men did in Israel. Different now from the book of the wars of the Lord because that's what God did. 
But here in the book of the righteous one, the book of Jasher, we have two accounts, Joshua 10, 2 Samuel 1. Both of them record heroic deeds done by two famous men in Israel. Okay, Joshua, let's look at the Joshua account after you get your description down. We'll start back with verse 12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day that the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, and beginning with this, ver with this word, son, this is the quotation taken from the book. <clears throat> and again, is argued over how far the quotation should go, forwards and backwards from this point. It appears to begin here. Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. The sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. That's the quotation. How do we know? Well, he says, is not this written in the book of Jasher? So we've got from the middle of verse 12 through the middle of verse 13, a quotation that Joshua himself is taking from the book of Jasher. Now, you may raise the question, well, Joshua is the one who's writing the book, and Joshua is the one who actually said that, so why take the quotation from another book? Well, this is a book that extended for centuries because the Second Samuel chapter 1 passage is all the way during the time of David. And it's still called the book of Jasher. And in Second Samuel 1, we'll see it's talking about a contemporary event in David's day that's also written in the book of Jasher. So it's a book that existed even prior to Joshua that contains these heroic deeds that were done by mighty and famous men in Israel. Now, although Joshua, of course, is the one that said that, he's writing this account here many, many years later. Maybe he doesn't remember the exact words that he said whenever he said it. Whether he did or whether he didn't doesn't make any difference. It proves that Joshua was reading the book of Jasher. doesn't mean that Joshua believed everything that was in Jasher or that everything that was in Jasher was true. But this particular account found in the book was true. And that's why Joshua is taking this out as a quotation. Now, it's even more interesting over in 2 Samuel 1. We've got our longest passage in any of these books found here in 2 Samuel. 1, verses 17 through 27. You might not have recognized how much material here really is a quote from this book. Now we have to change some things in the wording of verse 18, but we'll leave it that way here for just a moment. The last chapter of 1 Samuel, that is chapter 31, Saul and his sons have been killed by the Philistines on Mount Gilboa. And of course, David has now just heard the fictitious account of Saul's death by the Amalekite slave in the first half of 2 Samuel chapter 1. <clears throat> After he hears the news and kills the Amalekite, then we've got verse 17. And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son. And also he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. The beauty of Israel is plain upon thy high places and so forth. It is a poem or an ode celebrating the heroic deed done by Saul and done by Jonathan. The quotation from Joshua was celebrating his deeds that he did in Israel. So in both of these accounts, we've got the same type of material, relatively speaking, that's contained in the book. Famous deeds done by famous men. The only problem is the punctuation of verse 18. If you take verse 18 just as it stands, it's very difficult to get any meaning out of it. It looks like the whole statement is a parenthetical statement, but it's not. The, paren the beginning of the parenthetical statement should be before the word behold. In other words, your first parenthetical mark should not be before also, it should be before behold. <coughs> The 
furthermore, what in the world does this ode that David is singing have to do with the use of the bow and the arrow? You've got that in italics in your King James. It says, also he bade teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. So in verse 17, you've got David going to sing this lament over uh, Saul and Jonathan, and then in verse 18, but he also wants to teach you how to use the bow and arrow. Those really don't go too well together. So what it should be, the use, which is in italics, should be this ode. That's the only thing that makes sense here. <coughs> is this ode. All right, now let's see what we have. The writer of 2 Samuel, whoever that was, is writing, and he said, David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. And at a later time, he doesn't mean at the same time, but probably at a later time after he had given the lamentation, he also bade them to teach the children of Judah this lamentation that he just gave here this ode of the boat. And then the writer of 2 Samuel puts in a parenthetical statement, Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher to say, Now here is the account, but if you want to know more about it, you can look in the book of Jasher, and it's found there. Now if you leave the parentheses at the beginning of verse 18, you see it makes no sense whatsoever. You have to move the parentheses to include just the last statement. And then in verse 19, the writer of 2 Samuel begins quoting from the book of Jasher. And he's quoting from the book of Jasher as far as we know from verse 19 all the way through verse 27. But he lets you know if you want to find more about this, you can look in the book of Jasher and it'll be found there. And see, I imagine most of you didn't know that they are writing and using books like that. All right, a third book. Those are the two that we have a lot of information about because we've got long quotations. The other ones aren't necessarily in the same category, but the third book is called The Book of the Acts of Solomon. Found in 1 Kings 11.41. And it contained at least two things. Now, we give you the bare minimum. It probably, all these books probably contained more than what we're saying, beginning with the book of the Acts of Solomon. But all we can say is what we're told here in 1 Kings. For the continuation of...